Chapter 3, Basic Principles of Classical Conditioning. Part 3, The Importance of Timing in Classical Conditioning. One of Aristotle's principles of association was contiguity. The idea was that the more spatially or temporally contiguous or closer together two stimuli are, the stronger the association between them. So the idea that timing of the CS and the US might be an important uh, factor in classical conditioning has been around for thousands of years. There are many different ways of arranging the conditioned stimulus and unconditioned stimulus in time in relation to each other. Which of these do you think is likely to produce the fastest acquisition of a conditioned response? What about the strongest or largest? How about the weakest? All of the experiments discussed in chapter three so far have used short delay conditioning in which the CS begins a second or so before the US as diagrammed in figure 3.8. This temporal arrangement usually produces the strongest and most rapid conditioning, which is one reason it's so popular in experimental research. With short delay conditioning, if a CS predicts the US, it will become excitatory. If a CS predicts the absence of the US, it will become inhibitory. The same is true of simultaneous conditioning when the CS and US are presented at exactly the same time with 100% overlap. However, the predictive utility of the CS is necessarily lower with simultaneous conditioning than with short delay conditioning. Importantly for research, if the unconditioned response and the conditioned response are the same response, which is often but not always the case, differentiating between changes in the unconditioned response, such as habituation or sensitization, and the weakening or strengthening of a conditioned response is a challenge that requires additional control conditions or other experimental procedures. By contrast, with short delay conditioning, all responses that occur before the onset of the US must be conditioned responses, so we can use them to measure the strength of the conditioned response. With both trace conditioning and long delay conditioning, there's a gap between the onset of the conditioned stimulus and the onset of the unconditioned stimulus. In trace conditioning, that gap includes a period of time when neither delay is present, so establishing a conditioned response involves memory in the sense that the individual must remember that the CS preceded the US. As you might guess, longer delays tend to produce weaker conditioned responses. Just what constitutes a long delay depends on what the stimuli and responses are. A long delay for an eye blink conditioning paradigm might be a very short one if the conditioned response is glandular, like salivation. In long delay conditioning, the conditioned stimulus is presented until the unconditioned stimulus occurs, so it involves memory in a different way. At first, the conditioned response occurs with the onset of the conditioned stimulus, but with repeated trials in acquisition, the onset of the conditioned response gradually gets later and closer to the onset of the unconditioned stimulus, or perhaps the unconditioned response. One way to think of that is that the conditioned response is acquired in response to a compound conditioned stimulus, namely the CS plus the delay. In backward conditioning, the unconditioned stimulus precedes the conditioned stimulus. Compared to simultaneous conditioning, delay, and trace conditioning, backward conditioning produces much less of a conditioned response. In other words, the order of presentation matters. This might make more sense if you think about this arrangement in terms of what the conditioned stimulus signals about the US. Uh, specifically, uh, the conditioned stimulus signals the absence of the unconditioned stimulus now and the presence of the unconditioned stimulus later. There's plenty of research that suggests that in classical conditioning, the when is just as important as the what.